Welcome to The Real News Network, and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay. In Frederick Martel's book, published in early 2019, In the Closet of the Vatican, Power, Homosexuality, Hypocrisy. Martel paints a picture of the papacies of John Paul II and Pope Benedict as utterly depraved. Martel's book describes a situation of something he calls a ring of lust amongst many of the top hierarchy of the Vatican who conduct homosexual orgies and other kind of sexual abuse. And those people involved in that, he says, are in fact amongst the worst at condemning homosexuality. In a review of the book written by Matthew Fox, a former Catholic priest and now Episcopalian priest, Fox writes, Pope Francis is still stuck in doctrinal chains regarding sexuality, which are tough to throw off and break through because the ecclesial radical right has completely weaponized sexuality as its modus operandi, as its test of orthodoxy. From birth control to divorce to abortion to homosexuality and even masturbation, the right has chosen its weapon of choice. Now joining us to talk about his review of Martel's book and his the state of the Catholic Church is Matthew Fox. He's a former Catholic priest, as I said. He was stopped from teaching liberation theology and creation spirituality by Cardinal Ratzinger, who then went on to become Pope Benedict. He was expelled from the Dominican order to which he had belonged for 34 years. Matthew's the author of over two dozen books, including Occupy Spirituality, A Radical Vision for a New Generation, and The Pope's War, Why Ratzinger's Secret Crusade Has Imperiled the Church and How It Can Be Saved. Thanks for joining us, Matthew. Good to be with you, Paul. So uh, Martel's book describes in what some people have called rather salacious terms, uh, a, a really degenerate, corrupt, uh, hierarchy, much of the hierarchy of the church, uh, and not just about uh, cover up a pedophilia throughout the church, but their own activities at the highest levels while they lead the condemnation of homosexuality and, 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 and stand as the great defenders of morality. Uh, b before we get into the substance of it all, why do you believe this book is true? Like there's been some critique of it from within the Catholic establishment that it's kind of anecdotal, they say it's gossipy, it's not documented. So uh, before we get into some of the specifics and, and, and meaning, significance of it all, why, why do you believe this book is true? Well, I think the man who wrote it, Martel, had a, had, had a big team helping him. And he obviously got into um, the Vatican and a lot of people spilled the beans there. Uh, he was surprised, frankly, with, with how frank some of these people were. It really surprised him. And uh, uh, and frankly, even if 50% of it were true, it's appalling. But uh, I think there's every reason to believe that uh, it's true, that he has a decent reputation as a journalist. And um, he put years into this. And, uh, you know, the, the establishment, you say, may be crying foul or something, but they're not denying it. Um, I have to say that I myself was shocked. Uh, I, um, for years, I would, when I was speaking publicly uh, under those popes, I would say, you know, without fan, but simply that we're living in the most corrupt papacy since the Borgias. This book uh, bears that out. And <laughs> I quoted that to Andrew Harvey the other day who read the book, and he, and he said, this beats the Borgias. It's much worse than the Borgias. And it is true, you see, for me, from my point of view, what's really scary about it is um, the combination of self-hatred, um, these uh, uh, gay prelates in powerful places like heading the Congregation of Doctrine and Faith, which used to be called the Sacred Inquisition, these people who condemn my work as, quote, dangerous and deviant, unquote, for years. And then uh, one of their complaints about me was that I was... Um, accepting, if you will, uh, positive about homosexuals, and who wouldn't be in today's world if you've done your science? Uh, science has spoken, and these people are hating themselves. I mean, that's 
that's the perversion of this, you know. And then, of course, it spills over into oppression of others, like putting down gay people and and even uh, creating cover up for pedophilia and, and worse stuff. But my, as I say in my review, these people give being gay a bad name because they're so self-hating that um, that they produce these dogmas and doctrines about gay people have if they they have to be celibate. Well. They've taken vows of celibacy, and they obviously aren't celibate. Who are they to be telling gay people they have to be celibate the whole life? They make up these dogmas about morality that are just so passe. And I have to say, you know, reading the book, I ended up feeling sorry for Pope Francis because he's trying to run this organization, and it's full of these self-hating. You know, Adrian Rich talks about patriarchy as producing um, a fatalistic self-hatred in men. Fatalistic self-hatred, and that's what I was thinking as I read these horrible stories. These men are fatalistically hating themselves and, of course, spilling all that poison and toxin on the rest of the people by making judgments and creating laws and canon laws and and punishments for uh, not only gay people, but divorced uh, heterosexual couples and so forth. Uh, it's um, it's a study in uh, what internalized oppression will do to people. Right. It, it kills us all. Let me read a, a little section from your review of Martel's book. Martel describes in some detail what he calls the, quote, ring of lust that surrounded John Paul II in the form of bishops and others who chased after young Swiss guards, hired prostitutes on a regular basis, recruited luxury escorts, cruised outside the Vatican at public parts, and yet, quote, as cardinals, they enjoyed diplomatic immunity and were also protected at the highest level of the Vatican as friends of the Pope and his ministers. Yet these same high-flying prelates, quote, are now part of the opposition to Pope Francis. They harshly criticize any proposals he makes that are favorable to homosexuals and demand ever greater chastity, even though they have practiced so little of it themselves. Th there's a, a convergence here as what you describe as the self-hating homosexuality, and I, it should be said that Martel, who wrote this book himself, is a gay activist, uh, and the political right. Uh, we know that uh, Be uh, Benedict, who is the retired pope, still living in the Vatican, recently there was an article in The Guardian which asked the question, are there actually two popes in the, in the Catholic Church? Because the, the right wing of the church and the right wing of the political world, uh, sort of represented by Steve Bannon, who's very close to Cardinal Burke, who's very involved in this, these attacks on the sort of social democratic politics of Francis, it, 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 much of this really decrepit and degenerate uh, Vatican is in that right wing political opposition to Francis. Absolutely, and that's that's what's important, that they are um, carrying fight against Francis. You know, he had this synod a year or two ago where he tried to just make modest adaptations to reality and to science, tried to find a place for divorced Catholics more fully in the church, and tried to ease a little bit the opprobrium against homosexuals that was created by the previous two popes. I mean, um, as... as uh, Martel puts it, he says that Pope John Paul II uh, hurled, his, his entourage hurled itself into a new crusade against gays and became one of the most homophobic popes in the history of the church. And of course, Cardinal Ratzinger under John Paul II, because he was said of the head of the doctrine of faith, was absolutely fierce in attacking um, uh, gays and put out some horrible documents uh, against uh, homosexuality, so um, so this is going on at once. There's this this um, homophobic tirade and crusade, but there's also the right wing. I mean, th these are, this is a papacy that supported um, uh, uh, John Paul II supported um, uh, Trujillo and um, uh, the. You know the dictator of, um, of Pinochet, and um, in fact, he made the um, ambassador under um, P 
Pinochet, who became very close to Pinochet, he made him his Secretary of State. And uh, two Secretary of State, Bertone and Sodano, uh, under these previous two popes, they didn't like each other, but they were both hiding in the closet and reigning opprobrium on uh, liberation theology or uh, any movement in the church that was alive and was trying to um, uh, uh, work uh, with with the poor toward justice and so forth. And one of the most amazing stories for me is this Cardinal Alfonso Trujillo from Colombia. Because I wrote about him, what was that, about eight years ago in my book on the Pope's War. And um, what I learned was from Penny Lerneau, who was a Catholic journalist in South America, though she was from North America. She lived there for over 30 years. And um, she living in Colombia, she once got a call from the secretary of Cardinal Trujillo saying, we know at what time your daughter goes to school and comes home. Now, and Trujillo was completely involved in the drug trade in Colombia. And um, with that, she and her husband packed their bags within a week and, and left South America for good. They came back to North America. Uh, and she told me this story personally. They were scared, really scared, when they got their phone call. Well, I think in, then, your, in your review you mention, or unless it's Martel that says this, that Trio is involved in, or responsible for may, as many as 10,000 murders in Latin America. Uh, no, that's a quote about John Paul II. A priest in Latin America said that John Paul II is responsible for at least 10,000 murders in South America because of the positions he took with the support of the CIA at the time under Reagan against liberation theology and based communities, that over 10,000 people were murdered when the Pope, in effect, gave a green light to attacking uh, liberation theology and based communities. But um, Trujillo himself, uh, so he was made by the Pope head of the family, the congregation of the family, and he was taken to Rome. So he was elevated. This is a guy who threatened this woman and her child. And um, he was fiercely anti-communist or anti-left. But um, it turns out that he was, even in Colombia, he had a special apartment just for young men and boys that he would bring over to have sex with. And he would often beat them up at the end of the sexual uh, encounter. This is this is, um, is is a fact that Martel brought up. So here is this extreme right wing, anti liberation theology cardinal, who's threatening someone with death, and um, and then is elevated to be head of the family congregation in Rome, living in Rome, and um, he's carrying on uh, behind the scenes at night as he was in Colombia uh, with, um, with underage boys and prostitutes and so forth. It's, it's really shocking. It, it really lays bare the relation between um, a lot of right-wing uh, hypocrisy and propaganda and versus self-awareness and um, healthy, healthy living, healthy sexuality. So to me, that was one of the biggest stories in this book was Cardinal Trujillo, because it really tapped into what I had learned from him on a one-to-one -one, uh, meeting with a Penny Lerneau, who is an amazing woman who wrote marvelous books, serious books about the Catholic Church in South America and, uh, and liberation theology. One of her books is called People of God, a marvelous journalist. She's deceased now, but uh, she told me these stories face-to-face -face over dinner. Right. The... Uh this, this pretense of being so, quote unquote, moral and, yeah. and, and denouncing homosexuality and, and uh, sex outside of marriage and being pro against abortion and so on. Uh, but this great defense of morality, I'm, I'm doing quotation marks with my fingers, while, while practicing degeneracy, it's very uh, yeah. similar to what was going on in the circles around Hitler. Who, who the, the Nazi movement arose in the 30s, and one of their big planks or, was against the degeneracy, what they said had happened in the culture in Berlin during 1920s. While they themselves, it's known, practiced every form of depravity, they being the leadership of the Nazis. 
But this, in fact, is a very, very much a fascist movement, isn't it? With Burke and Bannon, and, and, and it's, it's, it comes from a fascist tradition. There's no other word for it. And, um, and Bannon is continually talking about you know, returning you know, to the times of the past. And of course, Ratzinger had the same language. Uh, they want to return to the glory of Christianity of the past. Well, first of all, there wasn't that much glory. There was, um, there was plenty of uh, darkness, the Inquisitions and the anti-Semitism and the rest. Uh, and of course, the witch burnings and the rest. So, you know, there were some, some decent uh, movements uh, in the Christian period, but, but the whole idea of nostalgia, and then it's all made up, it's all projection, and uh, it's illusion. And um, it's not that different from Donald Trump saying, make America great again. Uh, it's that same, let's make up a, a story and, um, and, you know, go there instead of dealing with reality. So it's, it's pitiful and it's sick. I mean, it is degenerate. It is so sick. And, um, you know, I, I don't think the Roman Catholic Church can recover from it, even if Francis, look what's happened. Francis tried to do a little bit of moving and he got blasted by this uh, cabal. Uh, it's a minority, uh, but it's a powerful minority that um, really shut down his efforts uh, to, um, to move in a more moderate and healthy uh, direction. Yeah, so recently, I think you know, sorry, have to ahead. die before they get better. Uh, recently, uh, 19 priests led by a, a British priest, uh, I think this is the second time something like this happened, uh, had a letter, public letter, uh, asking the priests and, and the uh, hierarchy of the church to declare Pope Francis a heretic. As I oh. mentioned earlier, there's an article in The Guardian that asks whether there's in fact two popes, and apparently now there's a movement saying Benedict didn't have the right to retire. So in fact, he actually is still the pope, so Francis isn't really the pope. Uh, but this has a real political dimension because this fight between this populist right-wing nationalism that's taking place both in the United States and in Europe, uh, again, Steve Bannon's yeah. a serious player in all this. Absolutely. Um, they see the, are they actually think they can bring Francis down and is that, is, and can they? Um, I think they want to, I think they're very serious about it. Um, and I think Burke is, is the front runner, but even Burke is exposed in this book. It's, although uh, the Martel, the author says, it's hard not to laugh about Burke. Uh, because he visited Burke's apartment and Burke didn't show up or he was late. So this guy wandered around the apartment and he found, he found closet after closet after closet of all kinds of urban capes and all this stuff. He's really into dressing up, uh, Burke is. Yeah, he, and, call, he calls him a raging drag queen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And here's this guy. Nothing against raging <laughs> drag charge. queens, by the way. <laughs> He's leading the charge. It is so... You know, you couldn't make this up. It's just that you can't make Trump stories up. You know, a novelist, you know, you wouldn't believe a novelist who told you these things. But that's why there's also a lot of humor in this book, even though it's pitiful. But you have to find the humor because otherwise you just weep. Now, uh, now this has been going on for decades and decades. And only now does this book, you know, quote unquote, break this out. Now, there have been a couple of other books that suggested it. But what do you make of the way corporate media covers the Vatican? It says it is sacrosanct. You would the popular understanding of the Vatican would never know of any of this. Well, that's true. The corporate media is afraid of the Vatican, or it used to be. But the problem is, it may lurch from being afraid to wanting to devour it, you know, and wouldn't stop in a in a fair middle middle of the road place. It seems to me. But, um, you know, I think the Vatican, like a lot of other institutions in the West, um, is in profound decline. And it's not just Roman Catholicism. I mean, Protestant seminaries are closing all over the place. Those that aren't fundamentalist in, in uh, well, in the West and certainly in, in America. And um, in fact, I just heard the other day that uh, an Episcopal bishop in a very large diocese at a gathering of his priests and, and said, effectively, it's all over. We don't have any money anymore and uh, not enough young people coming to church and, and it's all over. And, 
he didn't offer much hope or new vision uh, for his diocese saying those things. And you're so uh, there's a decline of what we were familiar with uh, in terms of Western religion and Christianity. But um, at the same time, there's a grassroots movement, and I've certainly tried to be part of it, tried to contribute what I could over the years, of liberation theology. Of you, you find it in the in the talk of uh, Paul Buttigieg, um, who identifies as Episcopalian, and uh, where he's talking about the message of the gospel is about welcoming the stranger, the immigrant, uh, and working for justice and the, and the poor and so forth. So in some ways, I think the Christian message is, is getting strong. It's the institutions that are out, utterly failing us and deserve to die, including the seminaries, because they have not been teaching the important part of religion, which is what I would call spirituality and mysticism, the experiential part. And uh, they've been so uh, caught up in the head and the theological academic stuff that they've missed out on what real religion is about. And it's about gratitude and it's about community and it's about the work for justice and liberation. So, and, uh, so, the, whether, what, so okay. the institution itself, I don't know, and it's from what I'm hearing from you, I'm not sh so sure it's worth saving anyway. On the other hand, as, as much as the Pope has, he does stand against this rising movement of real fascization. And, and it seems to me that's of, of some real significance to everybody. Absolutely. And his encyclical Laudate Si about the environment is a really important and wonderful piece of work. Just a, a few weeks ago, a scientist said, this is the greatest piece on science and spirituality that's ever been written. He said, I, tell, I show it to all my science friends, Christian or not. And I get lots of invitations to talk about Laudate Si by scientists. I was just at the Sierra Club a few weeks ago. They asked me to come. They wanted me to talk about uh, Laudate Si. Actually, I'm kind of proud to say Laudate Si was written by one of my students, actually, um, an Irish priest living in the Philippines. And um, so it's full of what I would call creation spirituality, this uh, lineage that I've been trying to rev up for my 45 years as a theologian. So um, absolutely, and of course, in that encyclical, as elsewhere, uh, Pope Francis takes on Wall Street, takes on the uh, shadow side of capitalism in a very strong way. He talks about the idolatry of money uh, and um, the idolatry of, of a, the golden calf and so forth. And he also makes explicit how it's the poor who are going to suffer the most, already suffering the most at the hands of climate change. And uh, so he's fierce about climate change and the environment and about, um, you know, working with the poor. And so he, he has a very strong, um, I think, um, presence. And, and, you know, when that encyclical came out, Rush Numbo said, well, clearly Pope Francis is a Marxist. So I think that's a pretty good badge for the Pope to be wearing an endorsement <laughs> from. <laughs> and I compare that to his compliment to me, the who and Pope Ratzinger called my work dangerous and deviant because what's going on in their, in their Vatican, in their congregation of faith is very dangerous and very, very deviant. All right. In the next segment, we're going to talk about Pope Francis's struggle to deal with the cover-up of sexual abuse in the church, uh, pedophilia, and whether he's actually, the new rules he's come up with are strong enough or are they going to be effective. So join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself with Matthew Fox on The Real News Network.